Good morning. Welcome. If you're joining us from the East Venue or online or here together in West Venue, glad you're here. Glad we have a chance to just lift our voices in song and to worship together and uh, to open up God's Word. I tell you what, it's, uh, it's a busy time of year, isn't it? What, a week ago, all the graduation parties and then everybody kind of managing their vacations and then kids went to kids camp this last week. And uh, yeah, right? Hey, be easy on the leaders. When you go pick up the kids, if they're like this, I mean, right? Uh, you know what it is to live with your kids. So you imagine 24-7 for four days, it's like, ha ha. Uh, and now the youth are at camp. So, so busy busy time and obviously busy in the life of our church in regards to asking the Lord to help us to find a, a senior leader. And uh, if you're a partner of C3, you received an email. We had a huge response. Thank you, partners, for doing that. And uh, the board has invited me to, uh, I'm honored, the board has invited me to make a very special announcement. And that is per your feedback of over 90% saying, yeah. Let's have that Adrian guy here. So Adrian Schumacher will be joining us as our senior leader, and he'll be here in two weeks. His first Sunday will be two weeks from today. And uh, so, so let's do some preparation. You can imagine his life, all the, all the stuff that he's got to put together. Uh, all the preparation he's doing to not only logistically he be here, but spiritually continue to be in that, uh, in that place where he can be a leader. And, and you know, we, we have an opportunity and a responsibility. We have an opportunity to pray for him, pray for him and his family. The changes that are going on, the adjustments they're going to have to make, the weight of leadership that he's going to be experiencing is tremendous. This, friends, it's, it's not easy being a pastor, you go, oh wait, you just show up on Sunday and talk a little bit. No, no, I wish, trust me. Uh, and so we, we have an opportunity to pray for him. Uh, we also have a responsibility uh, in preparing for his arrival. You go, well, what's that look like? Well, you know, we're only human, so we had this Adrian guy come and he spoke and, 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 and you immediately start transposing on him what your hopes and aspirations are. Oh man, I want him to come because you know what? When he comes, I know he'll do this, this, and this. All those things that you wish were being done, you now placed on him. Or you go, man, I, I want him to come. And, and when he comes, he'll have us stop doing these things. All those things that you wish we weren't doing, you're hoping that he'll stop. Can I invite us to have a posture and say, Father, whatever. We're going to submit to you. You're going to speak through our leader. He's, he's going to do some things that we're going to go, why did, he, why did he do that? Okay. We can get over it. Trust him. Love him. Pray for him. Other things you're going to yell a loud hallelujah and say, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Hey, that, that's good too, but can I invite you to just check your spirit, check your heart and say, Father, help me to be in the correct posture to receive from the new leader, to listen to his teaching, to receive his leadership and be the person that you've called me to be so that we can be the church that you've called us to be. Would you do that with me? Yeah, thank you. I tell you what, why don't we just do that right now? Let's bow your heads. Father, we thank you for Adrian and uh, the leader that he is, the godly man that he is, his desire to serve you. We thank you for his family their desire to be uh, followers of you. Lord, you know logistically what they're going through right now. You know the challenges that they're facing. And I pray, Father, that you would be there, that you would lead, you would guide, you protect, you provide, all those things that need to come together. Give Adrian a clear head, a clear mind to be able to be, begin thinking about what it means to be the leader at C3. And so, Father, while you're doing that with them, we, we open up our hearts and we ask, Lord, that you show us anything that needs adjusting in our lives and our hearts so that as Adrian leads us, we will be leadable and we will be servers and we will be disciples that are pleasing to you so that as a team, we can continue to do this wonderful work here in the Tri-Cities and abroad that you are wanting to do 
through the church called C3. Thank you for this opportunity. What a bright future is ahead of us. And we're excited to see what you're going to do in us and through us. Amen. Thanks, friends, for accommodating that. Well, you may have caught on by the bumper, by the video before I came up, that we have a new series we're starting today. And we've entitled it, Dear Younger Me. It rose out of a discussion we had as pastors. I said, you know, at one point I thought about reading a book, about uh, writing a book about all those things I wish I would have known when I was younger. And I was going to call the book, Dear Younger Me. Little, little things that, oh man, if I would have had that piece of wisdom, if I would have had that thought, surely I would have made the mistakes that I made. I would have been better off. And, and as we chewed on that, we realized, well, there's a book in the Bible. Well, the whole Bible, really. But there's a book in the Bible specifically that talks about practical guidelines of living. And it talks about those things that we would love to have learned sooner rather than later. You're sitting here, you're going, well, it's already later for me. Recognize that today is still sooner than yesterday. Catch my gymnastics there? Some of you guys are going, okay, I, I can avoid this one. Today is still sooner than yesterday. So the things we're gonna talk about today can be applied to all of us. Dear younger me, practical spiritual truths that God would prefer that we capture sooner rather than later. So the next few weeks, we're going to be, as I said, be looking into the book of Proverbs, which is called the wisdom book, the book of wisdom. And it was written almost totally by what is still considered, by who is still considered the, the most wisest man ever to live on the earth, and that's, and that's Solomon. And so there's some practical stuff in there that we're going to apply. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting something, so every once in a while I'll try not to blast your eardrums with that. We entitled, I entitled today's sermon 150K, 150,000. Just scratch your head, what? 150,000, what, what, what's that got to do with anything? 150,000 is the average number of hours that you will, be, you will spend working in your adult life. 150,000. 40% of your waking hours will be spent either working, thinking about work, or commuting. Now, unless, unless you're retired right now, you're groaning, right? The retired guys are going, nah, 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 nah. Those of us are still working are going, 150,000, are you, are you kidding me? More hours working, commuting, and thinking about work than eating, playing, vacationing combined. Wow, that's huge. So if that is the case, it should not be a surprise to us that God has something to say about a, such a large segment of our life. And input that he can give and advice that we can glean, glean to help us with that 40%. So the question that we have before us is, how do we honor God with our work? How do we honor God with our work? Well, the very first principle is work hard. It's the first expectation. Avoid laziness. Get to it. Let's read Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. It reads as follows. Consider the ant. There it is. Consider the ant, you sluggard. Don't you love it when the Bible talks about you sluggard? Is it okay for the Bible to say words like that? Consider its ways and be wise or wise up. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So the very first thing Solomon does, he, he points to the ant. He says, hey, hey. Oh, in another version it says, hey, lazy pants. I love this. He goes, hey, sluggard, consider the ant. No one tells the ant to get with it. No one tells the ant to get up and start working. On his own, he knows it's time, and then he must do that in order to have food for when they're after the harvest. It's humorous, I think, of uh, Solomon as he wrote this. He undoubtedly was hoping that his son would read it, and thus the version, hey, lazy bones, get out of bed and get a job because life is not coming at you on a silver platter. Where I'd like to show you uh, today's modern equivalent of this instruction. This cost me like hundreds of dollars. It's an expensive I don't care. I don't care. You got to get a job. What is this? What is this achieved? 
What is that? He's left. What is this going to do? My own my game zone. <laughs> Maybe you'll quit playing for a while, get a job, pay some of your bills. I'm never going to quit playing. He's having it. <laughs> Parent, that says it all, doesn't it? Right? I love that he says, I'll never quit playing. Did, I know the, the audio was tough, but one of those lines is, I'll never quit playing. The young man has a huge lesson that he needs to learn. Right? It's, it's not about getting to play all the time. And so now the, the, the measures that dad took are, are intriguing, but they're definitely uh, demonstrative uh, and somewhat effective. I'm sure the kid needed counseling after that, but maybe he, maybe he needed counseling before that too, for that matter. But why is it so important for us to be hard workers? Well, the obvious is laziness leads to poverty. I mean, it's just practical advice. If you're lazy and I'm out late or I want to sleep in or I just don't feel like working today, the results are you're going to lose your job. And if you lose your job, there'll be no pay. And if there's no pay, the bills will not be paid and there'll be no food on the table. So it's just practical, practical information for us. Proverbs continues in the following vein in 6 verses 9 11. It says, a little sleep a little slumber, just a little. Just, can I just have a, just a little? I just want to, can I hit the snooze? Can, I, I can hit the snooze. A little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Just, just a little bit. Boom, it'll hit your broadside. Proverbs 20 verse 4 continues to read and give us instruction as follows. If... You are too lazy to plow in the right season. You will have no food at the harvest. Duh. So this is written largely to an agricultural uh, community, and they understood that. If they didn't get out and work, and we are largely an agricultural community too. Hey, if we do not go out and plant, then there'll be no harvest. If there's no harvest, there's no food. Paul, in dealing with one of the churches that he founded in Thessalonia, was very adamant about this same truth also. And he writes, if anyone is unwilling to work, they should not eat. Pretty strong statement, isn't it? We're going to talk more about the Thessalonians later in today's time together. But even as we consider working, we're immediately faced with at least two challenges. First of all, as a parent, the first challenge is the balance between providing and teaching. As I had little boys, man, I, I, want them, I want them to have stuff. I want them to have food, obviously. I want them to have the cool clothes. I want them to have that cool lunchbox. I want them to have some great toys. As they get a little older, I want them to have some opportunities. I want them to be able to go to, the, to camp, to soccer camp, to whatever. I wanted that for him. The dan- for them, the danger is in providing all these things for my children, the balance is they start thinking that life just comes at them on a silver platter. And so somehow we have to make sure we check against that imbalance and we say, I need my children to do some work. I can't just hand them everything. So as parents, if you're sitting here, if you haven't addressed that already, if, if you're the one that's saying, hey, I just got to give it to them because I just want them to have the best. Understand you're creating kind of like our video here. Somebody that thinks that everything's just going to happen for them. The second challenge we have is potentially the motivation behind work. If we say work hard and we understand that, well, sometimes what is the motivation? Proverbs 16, 26 says, it is good for workers to have an appetite. An empty stomach drives them on. What the psalmist, excuse me, what the, the person writing the Proverbs is saying is, hey, that kind of motivation, that scarcity, that need, that hunger is a good catalyst to get you out of bed 
off the couch and out into the workforce. You see, we actually were created to work. We're not created to sit around. We are created to be functional. It is in our DNA and as proven to when God uh, created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden, he gave them jobs. He told them to work. He told them to tend the garden. He told them to name the animals. He told them to manage what was around them. He had given them work. So sometimes, though, we work too much. I got to ask, why? Well, I understand sometimes there's seasons in life when you have to work probably more than you want. I'm, I'm in one of those seasons right now. I, I just know that's, I'm doing what God wants me to do. But we got to ask our motivation. When we find ourselves working, 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 and becoming what many would call a workaholic, we have to ask ourselves why. Unfortunately, oftentimes, it's greed. Somehow we have learned that if we work more, I'll have more money, and if I have more money, I can have more toys. I can get that jet ski, I can buy that boat, I can buy that 15th car, I can do this, I can buy that bigger house. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the main purpose for work, however, if I can just bring us back down to earth, because that potential is there, we can all work more hours. The main purpose for work, as presented in Scripture, is to provide support for our family and for the work of the Lord. You find it throughout scripture. Nowhere does it say go out and work 80 hours so you can buy that luxury lot. Having said that, if your efforts are blessed and somehow everything you touch turns to gold and it's like, wow, as you take care of your family, as you take care of what God has led you to do in, in, in the work of, 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 of the church, enjoy the blessings he's given you. Enjoy that boat, enjoy that car, enjoy that house, but don't be a workaholic to try to attain that level. Are you with me still? Am I stepping on any toes? Are we okay? Okay, we'll dismiss in prayer. So why work hard? Here's another practical reason. Hard work leads to leadership. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24 reads as follows. Work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. I'm sure we are all aware that generally speaking, hard workers get promoted. And generally speaking, lazy workers get demoted. I understand I use the word usually because on occasion we are faced with a supervisor or a manager that we're going, what a lazy bum. How'd he get there? How'd she get in that role? So there's always an anomaly, but by and large, a boss is looking for people who are working hard. And so that's how you avoid being a slave is because by working hard, the boss says, I like Joe. I want him to have that role. What that does, that secures your job because no longer are you the first man on the, on the floor when it's time to get axed. And he starts seeing you for the leader that you are and you can start being influential at your place of work. Now, it could be that you're, you're gifted to be a leader. You might have the gift of leadership. That happens. And so don't go to your boss on your first day, hey, I, I, I've got the gift of leadership. Uh, put me in that position over there because that's where I deserve to be. Do the job that he's hired you to do. Prove yourself. Allow him to recognize that guy is a hard worker and he knows how to lead. People are listening to him, which leads us to the next point. Leadership is not always about position, is it? Leadership can be about influence. So say you're not that Supervisor, you're not that manager, you haven't got that, got that promotion, you can still be a leader by the influence that you bring to your teammates. Another great reason to work hard, hard work earns the respect of unbelievers. I love this one. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. We touched on it a little bit earlier. 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. Make it your goal... To live a quiet life, 
minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. So this is a repeat. Paul has already told these people this once, and now he's coming around again. The people who are not believers in turn will respect the way that you live and you will not need to depend on others. So let me set the stage of what's going on here. Paul is telling these people in Thessalonica, hey, quit being lazy. Quit being idle because what they had begun doing is saying, hey, you know what? Jesus is coming back real soon. So there's really, there's no need to plant any plants because Jesus is coming before the harvest. And, and so while I wait for him, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to, I'm going to get my eschatology figured out and I'm going to see what the prophet Jeremiah is saying. And I, and I think, you know, I think also I'm going to point at all those other things and become a busybody and start meddling. And, and, and Paul has recognized this and seen that this is what they've been doing. And he's saying, Hey, quit doing that work, earn respect. Don't be dependent on the people around you because Jesus is right around the corner. We have that tendency even today with all the events we're seeing in Israel around the world. Wow, it's right around the corner. That doesn't mean we'll go out and quit our jobs. That doesn't mean if you're a farmer, you, you don't keep planting your crop. Yes, his coming is sooner than ever before, but it's not yet. So keep working. If we are lazy, unbelievers aren't going to listen to us. They're going to watch us and go, no, you're, you're a lazy bum. Why should I take your advice? Why should I listen to you? Because actions speak louder than words. So here, here's the bottom line. If at all possible, if healthy, Christians should not be dependent upon anybody should not de be dependent on other Christians, on unbelievers, on the government. Don't live your life looking for handouts. That's not God's intention for us. If, however, health issues keep you from being able to work, either physically or mentally, you're just, you just do not have the capacity, then please, with an open heart, receive and benefit from all the help that we as Christians in the community and the government have established for you to get. While you receive that help, serve in any way that you are capable. Maybe that's simply having a smile on your face and showing the love of Jesus to the people who walk by your house or, or when you come to, to church. Whatever way you can, then serve and work in that way. So I have two questions. Two questions. One, as Christians, people are watching us work. What do they see? Self-reflection moment. As Christians, people are watching us while we are at work. What do they see? Number two, does your work ethic bring respect or disrespect? Do you at work portray that person that tries to get away with everything and they say, hey, come to church. I want you to hear about Jesus. You're not gaining a lot of, not going to garner a lot of respect if that's your work ethic. I have a friend who worked for a Muslim from Iran. And he said, Doug, this, my boss loves to hire Christians. Well, why so? Because he found that Christians work hard. Christians are dependable. Christians are honest. And so he hired a number of Christians to work for him even though he was a Muslim because, because of all those factors. Those Christians began to influence and showed a good reputation in the workplace so much so that that Muslim began sending his child to a Christian preschool because he wanted his children to learn more about what motivated these people to be great workers. So is that what happening at your work? If your boss looks at you, will he say, I want my kids to learn what motivates this person to bring that work ethic. I even want to learn from that person. I'd like to invite you to look at work differently possibly than, than you have. And that is this. We do not work for pay. We don't work for a paycheck. 
we work as our service to Jesus. It, it's, it's a whole different thing. In fact, let's look at these verses. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7. Work with enthusiasm as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Romans 12, 11 goes on and says, hey, never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. You see, our work is a service to the Lord. We often think, oh, I, I punched in my time card because I got to work and, and I'm, I got to, you know, I re, it, it impacts and it's, I, this is my boss, I've got to do it. No, and, and we also separate, we go, okay, I go to work and those are the things I do for pay and then the things I do for God is, is outside of that, like either at church or in service to him elsewhere. No, nowhere in scripture is work, family life, or service separated. It's all combined. All that we do is a service to God. All that we do. So the next time you go to your workplace, you go, oh, wait, this is service to God. It should not reflect on how I do or do not like my work or my boss. In fact, you might be sitting here going, Doug, but I hate my job. Interestingly, the verse in Ephesians that we just wrote was actually written to slaves. Tell me, did they enjoy their job? I think not. So God is saying, hey, doesn't matter what you do, work enthusiastically because that's your service to me. And as you do that, then it doesn't matter how you're treated and what's going on the other because it's your offering to God and, and he'll take care of the rest. You're sitting here going, hey, well, that's all good advice, but I'm retired. Well, you're still called to serve, friend. You're invited to use your work experience and your talents and your gifts for God and others. Oftentimes when we retire, we think this is my chance to go home, twiddle my thumbs, sit back in my lazy chair, have my wife bring my food to me, or if you're the wife, have my husband learn how to cook, whatever it is. But, but we, we, we think, oh, this is, this, is, this is when I don't have to do anything. This is when I get to get paid back for everything I've done. No, actually, when we retire, if I can shift our understanding, the scripture supports me in this, when we retire, we still have an opportunity slash responsibility to take those life skills that we've earned over the last 40, 50, 60 years and then implement them and, and be assistance to those who don't have the same skills, the same abilities, haven't had the same experience. An incredible, uh, incredible example of this in our body. Is, is our board. Uh, the C3 board, other than one of them, they're all retired. Now, I got to tell you, they would love to be doing anything else than spending the last 12 months going through resumes, poking holes in resumes, pursuing social media, making sure that the person is who they say they are, following up with reference calls, doing interview after interview after interview, ad nauseum, missing dinners, missing birthdays, so that we can have a leader here. No, what they did, they said, God has positioned us here and now for such a purpose as this. We have skills, we have abilities, we have experiences, we will submit and be used by God to help C3 find their next leader. Do we understand that kind of sacrifice? That is what God is calling us to, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing because the, the, the axiom, when we quit moving, we start dying is true, medically, mentally, emotionally. When you get into a sedentary lifestyle where nothing is demanded of you and you're not active, you're not doing things, your body and your mind and your emotions start shutting down. Now, I'd like to add one more person to that board. I said, all except for one of those board members is retired. There is one of them that works a full-time high-stress job and yet he still said, hey, you know what? I'm gonna give myself to this effort. And friend, we don't have, very often we don't have opportunities to say thank you to those who went through all this work to help us find Adrian. Could we explode in applause for that group right now? Can we do that? <laughs> the, 
we are, we are honored. Trust me, I've been around church all my life. We have been honored to have a board that has worked so diligently in this task that is in front of them. And I pray that God will bless them, strengthen them, reward them for their efforts. The second principle on how we honor God at work is work with integrity. Be honest. Don't cut corners. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 10 says, diverse weights and diverse measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Solomon is referring to the common measurement tool that was called a balancing tray. And in those balancing trays, they were not fixed. You would use weights on one side to make sure that what you were selling or buying weighed what they said it did, so then you would pay accordingly. Unfortunately, people would have two sets of weights in their pocket. In the right hand, they might have a smaller set of weights, and on the left pocket, a larger set of weights. And they'd go, if they were wanting to sell something, they'd put the smaller weights on the tray. So they're saying, hey, I'm selling you a pound of grain, per se. But then they put their weights that they had shaved some stuff off that didn't weigh a pound, and in that way, they could get more money for less product. And the, and the opposite was true when they went to buy something, they'd put a heavier weight and say, hey, wait a second, you're jipping me. You told me it was a pound of stuff and it really it's less than a pound, but this weight was actually more than a pound. Does that make sense? Is that, is that they had, it, it was just crooked. It was wrong. And, and yes, today our weights are largely fixed. We have government entities to make sure that everything is kosher, but we still have the opportunity to be dishonest. We still have the temptation to be unfair in our dealings. Possibly we charge too much for our service or for a good. Maybe we don't give correct change. Maybe we don't give 100% effort. Maybe we cut corners on value. Maybe if we're a lawyer and we respond to two emails in 15 minutes, we can bill those each client separately. We just made enough for a half hour instead of... There's different ways we find, unfortunately as humans, to work around the system and gain in a duplicity at this manner. Maybe we build double. Maybe we take extra breaks. 36% of the people who have internet at work said, hey, you know what? I can use my personal time doing internet work because I believe that's a perk for my job. Is that working with integrity as though for the Lord? Integrity is doing something the same whether someone is watching or not. Proverbs 16, 11 says, the Lord demands fairness in every business deal. He sets the standard. He sets, he demands that we be honest. He, he demands that we be fair. He sets the standard. Ephesians 6, 6, Paul writes, work hard. Not just to please your masters. Not just when they're looking, do you say, okay, they're looking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work. We all have those people in our workplace. So all of a sudden they look like, man, they're working hard. And the boss leaves and they're going, oh, that was close work hard all the time. Why? Because it's unto the Lord that your efforts are being done. Often we ask, hey, you know what? I I don't know how to share my faith, so I invite people to church because the pastor's good at it, and that's why we pay him, right? Because he'll tell them about Jesus. Yes and no. Possibly you're not gifted with the gift of evangelism, but you are gifted in the following. When God gives you a job, work it hard, work it diligently, work it honestly, and watch the faith statement you're able to make among your coworkers. They'll sit up and take notes. Wait, wait, he's not like you. He doesn't leave early and still build a boss. Hey, he's honest and all of his, he's, he's true, uh, trustworthy. You can share your faith by how you work at your job. So in conclusion, some questions for us, just for self-reflection. Does your work or your retirement reflect God's work ethic? Second question, do you demonstrate hard work and integrity at your workplace? Third question, do you have the respect of your fellow employees? Like I said at the beginning, this is just practical advice, but sometimes you go, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe I need to make some adjustments. I invite you to do that. Today is sooner than tomorrow. And so you just learned a truth that tomorrow you can implement and watch the difference that it makes in your life. Let's stand and let's worship as the as band leads us out.